Well, hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. It's the story where Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness. We're going to take a look at the three temptations, temptations which are common to us all and which will be recurring themes of Jesus' own ministry. We're going to make note of the three antidotes to those three temptations. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up by discussing the one thing that we as followers of Jesus can control. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab it, open it up to Matthew chapter four, and let's dive in. Now first, a little bit of context is always important. This episode, the temptation of Jesus, finds Jesus on the cusp of something new. It's a time of transition, one season ending, a new season beginning. You see, just in the chapter prior, Jesus is baptized. The Spirit of God descends on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven announces, This is my beloved Son. With him I am well pleased. What immediately follows this announcement, the, the first announcement in 30 years of Jesus' identity as the Messiah, at least that the Bible tells us about, is the story that we're about to read. The Spirit, the book of Matthew tells us, leads Jesus out into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And immediately following his temptation, Jesus will return to Galilee and begin his ministry. He'll begin calling disciples. He'll begin, he'll begin healing the sick. He'll proclaim the kingdom of God. And it's in this in-between, in between his baptism and the beginning of his public ministry, that Jesus spends 40 days in the desert, fasting, praying, praying being tempted by the devil. It's an in-between. He's leaving behind his normal, normal life in Galilee, but he hasn't yet entered into his public ministry of preaching and healing. So picking up Matthew chapter four, verse one, Matthew writes, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after for fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Oh, there's so much that could be said here. I'm just going to make note of a few things. One, Jesus is hungry. This shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. 40 days and 40 nights without food, of course, Jesus is hungry. He's a man just like you and me. He's a human. Second, it's 40 days. That number 40 in the Bible is, is significant. We see it again and again. The Israelites spend 40 years in the wilderness. Elijah, I think, spends 40 days in the wilderness. Noah spends 40 days on an ark. And not only is 40 significant in the Bible, the wilderness is significant in the Bible. Anytime someone is led into the wilderness, a person or a people, generally there's some sort of transition that's happening. But even more than that, there's some sort of identity formation that's happening. God's people, 40 years in the wilderness, unlearning the patterns of slavery, learning instead, being formed to be the people of God. And so Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness being tempted and he is hungry. Verse three tells us that the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Friends, this is the first temptation. It's the temptation of instant or cheap gratification. It's the temptation of instant or cheap gratification. And even more than that, it's the temptation to instant and cheap gratification in your weak spot. The devil knows that Jesus is hungry. If Jesus could ever have a weak spot, it's this. He hasn't eaten for 40 days and he's hungry. And so the devil goes right for that spot and tempts him to immediate, instant, cheap gratification. And the devil, the world, does this to us all the time. We're tempted to get what we think we want or think we need right now. Like food, immediately when you are really hungry because you want it right now. It's the temptation to try to take a shortcut, to do something because you think it will make you feel better, at least right now. And gosh, the world is always trying to sell us quick fixes and instant cheap gratification, isn't it? It's a temptation to just run to McDonald's and get a Big Mac rather than going to the store, <laughs> buying yourself some food, going home and cooking a well-rounded meal. And friends, so often we settle for the Big Mac when we could be having steak. Now, 
Jesus, he does resist the temptation to instant cheap gratification, and this is how he does it. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The antidote to cheap or instant gratification is knowing the power of compound interest. It's knowing the power of compound interest. Are you familiar with the idea of compound interest? I think it was probably 20 years ago that my dad, who works in finance, first explained it to me. And, and basically, this is how compound interest works. Compound interest teaches us that we're better off putting a small amount of money away consistently, day after day, year after year, starting very young then we are putting a whole lot of money away later in life or trying to get rich quick, hit the jackpot. Compound interest is the opposite of instant gratification. Compound interest requires patience and consistency and it works better if you start early. What the devil tempts Jesus with here in contrast is like trying to make one and a half million dollars or something playing slot machines rather than putting $100 away every month for 50 years. Now, you, you might get lucky. That happens from time to time in a slot machine, but it's a quick fix that isn't likely to reap nearly the same returns as patient consistency. In spiritual matters, compound interest, patient consistency, playing the long game, starting early is incredibly powerful. Now, you might be saying, Mike, how do you get compound interest from what Jesus says here? Look at this. Jesus responds to the devil's temptation with the Bible. Jesus knows the Bible. Jesus trusts the Bible. Even over and against the, the lies of instant gratification, he knows that every word that comes from the mouth of God is how we ought to live as people of God. A, a single word from God will change a life if we pay attention to it. A lifetime of words obeyed consistently over a life. Uh, it, it won't often be flashy, but oh, what a difference it can make. In the short term, it doesn't often seem powerful living from these words that come from the mouth of God. We might open our Bible and it, it feels like, well, I, I, you know, not much flash, not much bang. There's it doesn't often feel like jackpot. But friends, if you open that Bible day after day, week after week, year after year for a lifetime, it will change you. You'll end up with a treasure trove of riches. That's the first temptation to instant cheap gratification and the first antidote to know the power of compound interest in spiritual matters. The second, picking up in verse five, the devil takes Jesus, took him to the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What a flashy, crowd-pleasing miracle that would have been. It would have drawn the crowds and it would have made Jesus very popular very quickly for all the wrong reasons. The crowds would have loved Jesus for it. And they would have known right off the bat that this Jesus guy was different. Now, Jesus has already shown the devil that he knows the Bible, that he trusts the Bible. And so the devil tries to use the Bible against him by tempting him to flash and bang. It's, it's the temptation to prove your worth to others. That's the second temptation, to prove your worth to others. It's a temptation that won't go away. It's a temptation that I feel as a pastor each and every time I get up front to preach or open my Bible to teach. It's a temptation to prove myself, that I'm worth listening to, that I, I deserve to be here. And you know what? Those are lies from the devil. There's no doubt that you all face the same temptation every day. You feel the temptation to prove yourself to friends and to peers and bosses and coworkers, to prove that you're fun or smart or worth spending time with or worth getting paid more or worth the A or whatever else. And y'all, that pressure to constantly prove that you matter, it's a lie from the devil. How does Jesus resist this lie from the devil, the antidote to that lie? You've got to know who you need to please. 
You've got to know who you need to please. Jesus said to him, this is verse 7, again as it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus knew that the only one he needed to please was God. He didn't need to please the devil. He certainly didn't need to please the crowds. In fact, Jesus would end up regularly disappointing just about everyone. But Jesus knew that ultimately the only one he needed to please was God. Now, of course, trying to please God can feel kind of overwhelming sometimes in and of itself. But here's the thing. You don't need to prove your worth to God. Here's the thing. You don't need to please God by proving your worth to him or by being perfect. If that's the way to please God, then I'm certainly screwed. No, we, we please God by loving him. We please God by trusting him, by walking with him. You don't need to prove yourself to him. He already loves you. He's chosen you. He delights in you. So don't worry about pleasing the crowds. Instead, relax. Know who you need to please. And please him by loving him. Okay, the third temptation, verse 8. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. The devil said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Friends, the third temptation is the temptation to do things your own way or the world's way or the devil's way. It's the temptation to sell out your center. Look at this, the, the devil offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, which is funny because the kingdoms of the world already belonged to Jesus and would continue to belong to Jesus. And yet still the devil tempts him with this. He tempted Jesus to do things his way, the devil's way, rather than Jesus's way. Because Jesus became king not by worshiping the devil, but Jesus would become king by way of a cross. Frankly, it would have been much easier, much less painful in the short term for Jesus just to worship the devil. The temptation to worship the devil in order to get something that might seem good is the temptation to put anyone or anything in the center other than God. In this instance, obviously, worshiping the devil is a bad choice, okay? Um, but here's the thing. With us, with you and with me, the devil, oh, he is really sneaky. And so what he'll do is he'll take a good thing and he'll twist it just a little bit until we start to put that thing at the center. And before we know it, a good thing has become an ultimate thing. And when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing, this is something a friend of mine used to always say, it becomes a destructive thing. The devil likes to do this with us. He takes a good thing like friends, or school, or a marriage, or children, work, money, a good thing, all gifts from God. And he twists it just a little bit so that a good thing becomes an ultimate thing and it comes to the center. Before we know it, it's become a destructive thing. But Jesus responds to the devil here in verse 10 by saying, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And so the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The antidote to this temptation to sell out your center, to do things our own way or the world's way or the devil's way, the antidote is to worship God, to worship God regularly, to worship God with others. Here's the thing, when we worship, it takes us out of the center. Worship reminds us how big God is. And while it doesn't make those other things, those gifts from God that I mentioned earlier, some examples of, it doesn't make those things unimportant altogether, nor, nor should it make them unimportant. It, it, it puts them in their right place. That is, it puts God in the center. When I worship God, it's not that my marriage or my kids or my work don't matter. They, they do. They are still good things, still gifts from God. But worship reminds me that I don't serve those things in the same way. It puts God back in the middle. It puts those other good gifts of God in their right place. That's how we resist the temptation to do things the world's way or our own way or the devil's way. We do it by worshiping God.
Now we've seen three temptations and three antidotes. There's one thing that we can control and this is where I'd like to wrap up this video. Here's the thing that I find so interesting about this particular text. Jesus actually had the power and the authority to do each of these things. The devil wasn't tempting Jesus with something that only the devil could give him. Jesus had the power to turn rocks into bread. In fact, in just a few chapters, he's going to multiply bread and feed a multitude. Jesus had the power to launch himself from the, the roof of the temple. We know this. Jesus is able to walk on water for crying out loud. He's able to calm the storms. The angels would have caught him. We know this because right here in verse 11, angels come and minister to him. The kingdoms of the world that the, the devil shows Jesus, those are his. Jesus is the king of kings and all the nations of the world belong to him. These, the temptation wasn't to get the sort of things that weren't already his. The temptation was to get those things Satan's way instead of God's way. The temptation was to get those things Satan's way instead of God's way. If God is really God, then God is really in charge. It, it means he, he really does have a plan and he really does have the power to see that plan through. And if that's true, then it means that we actually don't control the end result of hardly anything at all. What can we control? The only thing, if God is really God, that we really can control is how we live. We control how we choose to walk. We control what we choose to prioritize. We control what or who we worship. Jesus here is tempted to do things Satan's way. You will be tempted to do things Satan's way or the world's way or your own way over and over and over again. And so the decision that lies in front of you, the decision that lies in front of me is this. How, how will you choose to live? Will you choose to live and to walk God's way? in the way of Jesus or some other way. The truth is the other way will often seem easier. It's the way of instant gratification. It, it might seem more fun, it might seem flashier. It may seem the way that everyone else is living. Jesus was tempted to do things that way too. We see that right here in Matthew chapter four to pick the short term, cheap instant gratification. Jesus was tempted to, to pick the people pleasing way. Jesus was tempted to to do what he was called to do any other way than God's way. But instead, he chose to know and to trust the word of God. He chose to please God rather than others. He chose worship. He chose to live and to walk God's way. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna make a handful of videos here that explore the ways and the means of Jesus. We'll continue to trace some of these themes, instant gratification, worship, people pleasing throughout the gospels, because Jesus is going to continue to be tempted by these same temptations, just as we are. And just as Jesus resisted the ways of the devil by knowing and trusting the Bible and doing what it says, so in this series of videos, we will open our Bibles each and every week, we'll listen to them, we'll, we'll learn the Bible, we'll learn to trust it so that we too might walk in the way of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining me. If this was helpful for you, please do like, share, and subscribe, and come back next week as we continue to explore these themes together.